Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. This past week was a newsy week across the national park system. Towards the end of the week, the National Parks and Conservation Association filed a lawsuit against the National Park Service for failing to adequately protect Biscayne National Park's coral reefs and fisheries. We also reported on how the rebounding of the coronavirus pandemic was leading to more and more closures across the park system, and a lawsuit was filed to force the National Park Service and Interior Department to resume a grizzly bear recovery program for the North Cascades. President-elect Biden's choice of U.S. Representative Deb Holland of New Mexico to be his Interior Secretary also drew widespread attention. If confirmed, Holland would be the first Native American to hold that position. You can find those and other stories at nationalparkstraveler.org. Year after year, a little more of the visual history of Cape Lookout National Seashore on the Outer Banks of North Carolina is lost. Hurricanes and nor'easters take their toll on the structures in two small villages there, slowly erasing the reminders of what once was a thriving shipping and fishing hub. The constant struggle between what can be saved and what must be surrendered weighs heavily on the minds of park officials, and too often, the choice winds up being Mother Nature's, and not theirs. The traveler's Lynn Riddick spoke with Cape Lookout National Seashore Superintendent Jeff West to learn more about this seashore and the efforts to save whatever historic structures they can. Western National Parks Association is a nonprofit education partner of the National Park Service. WNPA supports parks across the West, developing products, services, and programs that enhance the visitor experience, understanding, and appreciation of national parks. Learn more at WNPA.org. We all aspire to leave a legacy of good, right? One way or the other, our parks and public lands are all of our legacies. Join Wild Tributes for the Parks community with apparel that pays tribute to where legacy roams. Together, we can and will make a difference for the parks. Join us at wildtribute.com. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. History abounds at Cape Lookout National Seashore along the coast of North Carolina, but a number of factors are taking their toll on the structures there that have helped tell the area's story over the years. Here to talk about what's going on is Superintendent Jeff West, joining us from Park Headquarters on Harker's Island. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to The Traveler. Hi, Lynn. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Absolutely. Would you first tell us a little about Cape Lookout National Seashore? Well, Cape Lookout National Seashore is only accessible by boat. We've got about 56 miles of barrier island that protects an important part of the North Carolina coast. We mostly manage it as a natural barrier island. We do have uh, two historic villages uh, on Cape Lookout and uh, some modern overnight cabins. Uh, We also have a uh, one of the last free roaming horse herds on the eastern coast uh, on Shackleford Banks. We do have uh, about eight and a half miles. Shackleford Banks is a designated, actually, it's a proposed wilderness area. So it's a it's a varied environment. Lots of opportunities for people to come out here and enjoy things. How long have you been superintendent there? I have been superintendent here for three years now. I want to talk about some of the most historic areas of the seashore and what they've been up against environmentally over the years. The villages you just mentioned. First, Portsmouth Village. It is on the north end of the National Seashore and completely uninhabited. I've actually been there a couple of times and it's not easy to get to. In fact, you have to take a boat, like you said. And when you arrive, you're confronted by a wall of mosquitoes. (laughs) 
But <laughs> but I was really fascinated to learn that for a hundred years or so, it was quite a bustling place with as many as 600 people living there at its peak with some 109 dwellings. Would you take us back to that time? Tell us how the area was settled and what life was like. So, you know, Lynn, the, this period of our history, uh, mid-1700s, uh, the maritime trade was incredibly important uh, to the uh, developing colonies over here. And uh, Portsmouth came about because it was in a location near Ocracoke Inlet that could control that inlet and support operations of that inlet. Uh, it was founded in 1753. We know that uh, houses were in place by 1760. And by 1780, it was a bustling uh, port of entry into North Carolina. And the goods that were shipped through Portsmouth, either coming in or going out, were an integral part of the economy. And uh, it continued that way, even after other inlets opened up over the years due to storms. Uh, Portsmouth was a bustling community up until 17, uh, mid-17, uh, correction, the mid-1840s, and continued to contribute until the Civil War. Now, by 1971, there were only three residents left on the whole island. One died and the other two moved away. So what caused the population decline in Portsmouth Village over the years? Was it just because it was so remote? Well, remoteness certainly had a lot to do with it, but the fact of the matter is the importance of Portsmouth as a port of entry diminished over the years. Wilmington became more prominent, uh, Hatteras Inlet had opened up, and ships were able to go through there. You know, part of Portsmouth's problem was the inlet, Ocracoke Inlet. It was uh, it was a difficult inlet to navigate, and ocean-going ships typically could not make it uh, through and then access the internal ports of Newburgh and Washington. Uh, instead, cargo had to be lightered off uh, into smaller boats that could navigate Pamlico Sound and make it into these these other ports. And uh, by lightered, I mean actually physically unloaded into the smaller ships. And as goods were sent out through Portsmouth, the same thing had to happen. They had to be cross-docked and loaded into the larger ocean-going ships. As the need for Portsmouth diminished, so did uh, the population. And, you know, it for a long time, it, it uh, manifested itself into things like the fishing industry, for instance, the Menhaden industry it was very big, uh, oysters, shellfish of all kinds. Uh, uh, at one point in time, many came right out of Portsmouth. So uh, the fishing industry kind of took over at that point. But even with fishing as prominent and good as it was at Portsmouth, uh, you still had to have things like ice. And as the years went by, it was a whole lot easier to fish out of towns on the mainland rather than try to transport everything you needed out to Portsmouth to support fishermen out there. It's kind of just like, you know, any other uh, small town. Uh, the times change, the needs change. And when you combine that with the location, it just made it too difficult for folks to live out there. And I have to mention storms take their tolls. Living on the Outer Banks is tough anyway. And without, you know, a road to take you into into the larger towns or to get supplies from them, you know, it was, it was very difficult, very difficult living out there. What storms caused the most damage over the years and, and most recently? Well, you know, the, the, the big storm that had a huge impact on Portsmouth was the storm of 33. A lot of people actually left Portsmouth. Um, we saw other uh, small communities on the Outer Banks disappear after the storm of 33 as well. It wasn't so much uh, the damage, although that was fairly extensive, as it was people were just tired of it. And it's a lot easier to, to live uh, from uh, mainland uh, cities, so uh, at least ones that had roads that went into bigger towns. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of folks still left out there at Portsmouth, uh, and they were tough. They were eking out a living. You know, that's where their parents had been before them, and they, they stayed. It was a, a very hardy folk that lived out there. But the reality of it is, you know, things change. We we have we evolve. Uh, sometimes we just want an easier way of of living. You mentioned the, the mosquitoes at one point in time. The mosquitoes were alive and well then too. It it's uh it's hard to live out there. 
What about the most recent um, hurricanes that have taken a toll on the uh, village? So Hurricane Dorian, which which was in 2019, was very reminiscent of the Hurricane of 33. In fact, uh, as near as we can tell, it was probably worse. Every single historic structure that we had out at Portsmouth was damaged by the storm, some of them extensively. Uh, our support facilities received some damage as well. The village of Ocracoke, across Ocracoke Inlet, was completely inundated during that storm. Uh, we saw seven to nine feet of water wash over Portsmouth and North Corps Banks, the, the larger island that Portsmouth is associated with. And in fact, North Corps Banks was cut through by 54 major inlets. Uh, it was a sound side event, the, the uh, Storm Dorian. We try not to use that name too often anymore, but that Dorian uh, pushed a lot of water up into the backside of Pamlico Sound. And as uh, as it went by, all that water came rushing back out and just washed right across North Corps Banks. Before Dorian, how many structures were remaining in the Portsmouth Village, and what is the predominant architectural style? Well, you know, so we have a number of houses out there, but a house standing by itself doesn't really represent what it took to live there. So there were a lot of historic structures that were associated with each house, cool houses, which was the Portsmouth Village way of refrigerating things net houses, storage houses, and summer kitchens were also associated with these buildings. And what was really, you know, hard to take was it wasn't just the houses that were damaged. A lot of these support structures were completely wiped away too. Now, of all of the structures that we had out there, there were about 54 total structures out there at Portsmouth. Every, like I said before, every single structure took damage. Some of them were completely erased. They're just gone. We couldn't find any trace of them. Uh, a number of the structures were, were washed. Well, we, we had one roof that ended up uh, about a half a mile from its original position. Uh, but we had a number of structures that were washed out into the marsh that we were able to recover. I, I think the thing that's important you know, initial assessments indicated that nine buildings would need to be demolished out there, that they were unrecoverable. When we went out there and took a closer look with the historic preservationists and uh, our carpenters who have worked out here for, well, one of them's been here for over 20 years. Uh, the other one's been here about 20 years. They've done a lot of work on these structures and they, they recognize some, well, they recognize some things that folks have always recognized at Portsmouth. There's a lot you can do to rebuild these structures and a lot you can do to repurpose pieces of the structures in other structures so you can preserve them. So we took a closer look at things and uh, we were able to rebuild or restore or stabilize all but two of the structures that were originally thought uh, that would have to come down. Those two structures took substantial damage. I, one of them was almost completely destroyed and scattered all over the march. Uh, the other one was picked up off of its foundations and twisted, breaking most of the structural members of the of the house. So uh, those we don't believe we're going to be able to do anything with, but the others we have. And, you know, it, it's not a matter of just rebuilding them or trying to rebuild them. I mean, it costs a lot of money to do that, but it's also looking at the type of damage we got and figuring out how we can put those structures back and meet the secretary's standards, but put them back in a way that they're more resilient to, to future storms. I want to ask you a little bit about some of the things you can do to protect these structures against the next hurricanes. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I want to go back to the structures that are well beyond repair that you mentioned and have to be scraped to the ground. Tell us about these structures and who occupied them and uh, what happened there? Well, two of the structures are in Portsmouth proper, and one of them is on uh, an island just south of Portsmouth called Sheep Island. Now, the two structures at Portsmouth, one of them is called the Arm Tech House, and that's a modern structure. Uh, it was built in the 1950s, wasn't contributing structure to the uh, Portsmouth area. Uh, it was built on the on the side of a of an older house, and some of the remains of that older house are there. Uh, and principally, it served as a hunting lodge for a couple of different companies, and 
and uh, their subsidiaries. Uh, hunting and fishing has always been a, a staple of the Down East communities, and, and that was one of the things that this uh, building represented. The Frank Gaskell House was built in about 1930. He was a a fisherman, uh, a, a woodworker, you know, uh, did a lot of, of jobs, as many people who lived in Portsmouth had to do. And uh, that structure was last uh, in use by people in, in the uh, 1980s as a lease house uh, there. It sits right out on the point and is actually the, the one house that was most endangered in fact, a vulnerability study that was done in 2017 had identified Frank Gaskell houses in great peril uh, from storm surge and, and winds just because of where it lives. The Battle Brothers, uh, Salter Battle Fishing Lodge, which is down on Sheep Island, uh, was constructed in the 1940s. There was an older structure there that was damaged in the storm of 33. It was actually moved over to Atlantic. But uh, they reconstructed a, a fishing hunting lodge out there in, in about 1940. And, uh, you know, the importance of that is that, once again, there was one of those lodges that represented an important piece of the economy for the Down East community. People would come in from all over the country, uh, business executives and, and political leaders, to hunt and fish in this area. And that was one of the places that they would go into to stay and uh, and then conduct activities from. So that representation is, is very important, um, and it was just, you know, one too many storms. Now, when a structure is damaged in a hurricane, how do you go about repairing it? What's the process? And who ultimately decides that a structure is beyond repair and should be raised? Well, you know, when we go in uh, after a storm, there's a couple of things you want to do. The skin of a historic structure, and by that I mean the windows, the doors, the siding, the floor, and the roof. Uh, we try to make sure that, that water can't penetrate any of those things. So we try to make sure that skin is intact. And typically, you know, we don't, there's there's not money that comes along that allows us to do that. So what we try to do is button it up as best we can. We'll make temporary repairs, put on patches, things like that in order to seal that skin up good. But before you can seal the skin up good, you got to make sure it's dried out inside and cleaned out. In this particular case, the floodwaters came up, you know, three and four feet in some of these buildings. So all that had to be cleaned out. And we had to put in uh, drying fans to dry everything out. Of course, that took generators to do that and quite a few people. But that's our first goal is get everything cleaned out. Then we seal up the structure uh, as best we can so that there's no other penetration from the elements. And, and it's a difficult, it's a difficult as you can imagine. I'm just getting people and equipment into an area, it's, a, it's about a 45-minute boat ride from our, our nearest access point to get up there. So... Hauling all that stuff up there has to be done. Once that assessment is, is complete, we've buttoned it up as best we can. You know, by then we've garnered enough information to make a judgment of what can be done. Some of the structures just structurally we could not do. Arm Tech, for instance, half of the building was actually scattered around the marsh there. Uh, there was just no way to, to seal it up. So the call comes to me, to the superintendent, what are you going to do with the structure? And, you know, I, I'll look at things like finances, what's available out there, uh, who is available. You know, during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, we've had a hard time getting in skilled folks to do certain procedures. Uh, the uh, cemeteries were damaged out at Portsmouth, for instance, and getting in uh, specialists who could deal with the monuments long term was difficult. You know, we were very fortunate we had some of those come in ahead uh, with the team. but there's still long-term care that's got to be done. And, and when we look at that, it's, uh, you know, we've got to weigh all those pieces in there when we decide what we're going to do with the structure, not to mention how important that structure is to, to the, the, both the community and uh, to the cultural integrity of Portsmouth or Cape Village, whichever one we're talking about. Yeah, I want to go back to the cemetery point you were talking about. Some of the earliest settlers of the Outer Banks are buried in cemeteries there, which were also damaged by Dorian, as you mentioned. And tell us about the extent of the damage and how these cemeteries were ultimately restored. 
because you had a very interesting specialty crew come in. Yeah, we were that we were very very fortunate that one of the teams that came in was from Gettysburg, where they deal with monuments every day. So a number of their uh, of the employees that came in to support us during the hurricane recovery were monument technicians. And uh, they're very familiar with foundations of these stones, uh, how to reset them, how to repair them. And in many cases, they were able to reset uh, our, our headstones. They were able to repair some of them. Now, the fences uh, that surrounded two of the cemeteries were completely washed away. And, and uh, hopefully at some point in time in the future, we'll be able to repair those. But the important thing, of course, was getting the monuments restored to the best we could. Not everything could be done. Uh, there were some of the stones that when they were knocked over, they were damaged fairly extensively and were re- going to require more technical work. But almost all the stones that were toppled, they were able to reset. So, you know, when that team walked away from here, they had done a tremendous service, you know, for visitors and into the park uh, and restoring those. Are these cemeteries located on higher parts of the island? Because I wonder about all that water that sits there during a storm surge and what becomes of the caskets buried below the headstones. Well, you know, all of those uh, cemeteries are pretty much the same level of every other place there at Portsmouth, roughly a foot above sea level. And, uh, the uh, they they have no extra protection um, by being elevated at all. And I'll be back with Jeff West, superintendent of Cape Lookout National Seashore, after this short break. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the traveler's content please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It is an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. This is Lynn Riddick, and I'm back with Jeff West of Cape Lookout National Seashore. Jeff, the second area of concern that I want to ask you about is Cape Lookout Village, which is more south toward the point of the Cape. Three other houses there are damaged beyond repair as well. Tell us a little bit about the other historic buildings in Cape Lookout Village and the history of these particular structures. Okay, uh, Cape Village also has a long history. Of course, the, we've got the lighthouse there, and the lighthouse is standing now. It was built in 1859, and so there's always been a human presence associated with there. The life-saving structure was built in the late 1880s, and uh, the Coast Guard have had a long presence there uh, as, they, uh, as the uh, services were combined. 
Uh, the Coast Guard stayed out of there until the uh, 1980s. Uh, so there's been a long presence there. Uh, many of the structures that are out there are associated with keepers or Coast Guardsmen, life-saving service uh, members uh, at one point in time or another. Now, there was also another big operation out there in 1915. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers built a jetty out there that was designed to improve the harborage. And a number of jetty workers came out there to live. And uh, one of the structures that was destroyed was one of the jetty workers' houses. It was built in approximately 1915 and sat out there very close to the ocean uh, on the sound side. And, you know, Hurricane Florence actually did a number on that house. And it, once again, it, it was a wind damage type event where much of the structure was destroyed and scattered around out in the marsh. Uh, one of the other, uh, well, huh, probably the, the most significant structure that was out there uh, was uh, nicknamed the Casablanca. And uh, it was a, a large two-story structure with two chimneys painted white. And you could see it from miles away. Stood out there right on the, at, at one time, right on the end of the spit there uh, near Cape Lookout Bight. It was very popular. There were many dinner parties that were held out there. Uh, many of the people who visited the Cape stayed at Casablanca. Uh, many folks living today uh, had relatives that stayed in the Casablanca. So it's it, it's it's well uh, within the history of the community. And, uh, you know, one of those things that any mariner coming by associated with Cape Lookout because uh, you could see it from so far off. Uh, the last structure that uh, was heavily damaged by the storm was actually a modern structure. It was built in the 1950s. Once again, it was one of those uh, buildings that was probably built around or on top of uh, an older structure. It had been built and rebuilt so many times, either from storm damage or just from modifications that the original structure is no longer even recognizable, and you, you, it's not a contributing structure to the historic district. To your previous point, how are you able to reuse or repurpose materials from the structures that have been destroyed? Well, you know, all of these structures that were, were built in similar time frames to other structures that were out there. For instance, the Jetty Worker House built in 1915 is right next door to uh, a standing structure that was also built at that time frame. So a lot of the materials went in, uh, the same materials went into both of the structures. So any of those things that we can pull out that are intact and usable for repairs to other structures, we're going to do that to the extent we can. And there's another thing I, you know, we, we just re-roofed the uh, summer kitchen by the keeper's quarters. And uh, we kept a lot of the shingles that came off of that structure uh, for an artist in residence program. So we try to find those types of things in the older structures that might lend themselves to different projects that our artist, artist in residence might do. But the big thing for me is continuing that down east tradition of reusing materials from the older structures and other structures to maintain them and and make sure that they live on. And what is the predominant architectural style? Well, there's a there's an it's interesting you say that. I I almost wouldn't say there's a predominant style because we see so many different errors and different techniques. There is a modified craftsman style that is pretty uh, well established uh, on at, at uh, Portsmouth, for instance. And, and uh, there's also something that's known as the uh, jump and a half house. It's a kind of a, a down east or outer banks construction. It's a story and a half uh, house. It can have various, various types of siding on it. But uh, you'll see both of those structures in both villages. And how difficult and expensive has it been over the years to keep up with the maintenance of these structures? What kind of budget do you have? And do you have partners that can help with the financial assistance in maintaining these uh, facilities? So, you know, the, the care of the care of the historic structures is something I, I hold uh, very dear and near I, not only are we supposed to do it, but it's just the right thing to do. These 
structures represent history and culture uh, of the area. And of course, that doesn't mean that a budget comes with the responsibility. So we have to carve what we can out of the budget and we are constantly, you know, putting in for project money, special project money for the repair and rehab of, of these houses logistics of getting supplies and materials and people into into them drive up the cost contracting uh the contractors definitely recognize the uh expense of of uh travel uh overnight stays logistics and uh, and so our costs are are fairly high on contracting jobs uh, and we leverage everything we can. Uh, we have a, a very active donation program for the care of historic structures. We've got a great friends group up at Portsmouth that uh, is made up of, uh, of descendants of residents of Portsmouth and a lot of other people that really care about Portsmouth as, a, as an area. And and they contribute money and hours. Uh, you know, one of the one of the things that I I find very positive about that is that uh, volunteers uh, several times a year uh, in typical years will have volunteers from from the Friends of Portsmouth Island come out there to do work projects, which really helps us a lot. And like the specialty cemetery crew, um, the Park Service brings in employees from around the country to respond to hurricane issues in the National Seashore, as you mentioned. Tell us a little more about how that works and the expertise that you tap into. Well, you know, it's it's funny because uh, in in uh, in times past, the Park Service has had the numbers of employees to pull from. We don't always have that anymore. It's it's uh, it's hard for parks to release people to come and work here, even recovering from from a, a disaster like this, simply because they don't have the people. Uh, that they used to. So if they send somebody away, their their work's not getting done there. But I will say this, most of our sister parks are very generous in getting us help. We are able to request the types of, of uh, help we need. And, you know, typically for us, it's it's carpenters and people who can function in a variety of roles, whether it be roofing or siding or window repair or door repair, in this this last case, we really pushed for some uh, carpenters who had historic preservation knowledge, and it proved invaluable. They were able to do things that, you know, you throw them in with our guys that have been working on these buildings. They'll get over there and they'll be able to talk it out and figure out how they can do things that people say can't be done. And as a result, you know, we've ended up with a lot of structures that a lot of folks thought we wouldn't be able to hang on to. We, we've ended up hanging on to them and uh, shoring them up and making them, getting them into a repairable position. So what has been done and what can be done to these historic structures to make them more able to withstand wind and water from the next hurricanes? Well, you know, that's always the, the, the wild card, right? So, you know, it depends on the storm. Uh, you know, you can you can build a concrete bunker and lose it in, in the wrong kind of storm that hits the wrong way. But uh, what we can do is take the lessons that we've learned from these storms that we've seen and the damage that's occurred. We can use science to help us with uh, understand storm surge and the kind of impacts it has on the, the structures. One of the things that I, I uh, would like to point to specifically is, uh, you know, the flooding events. What we saw with Dorian were uh, structures that were being flooded, and then the, as the storm surge subsided, water that was still strapped, uh, trapped in the inside the structures came rushing out through walls, actually just blew out walls and structural members to escape, and that was as a result of pressure being removed from the outside as the outside water fell and then pressure from the inside still being there because of all the water inside. So, you know, we, we looked to a couple of things. One, we looked to, to uh, the folks who understood Portsmouth and how it was done in the first place and uh, came to understand that the flooring was our enemy in a lot of ways. So it was holding that water in after it flooded. Now, historically, 
islanders frequently had trap doors built into their houses. And these trap doors, when water rose, would actually float out of the floor space, and then water could escape uh, when it began to subside outside by flowing out these large trap doors. So that was one of the things we did is we reinstalled trap doors in some of our critical buildings. The other thing we looked at was uh, it's something similar to a flying buttress, but it's not. It's a brace that's built into the foundation of a number of structures um, uh, at both Portsmouth and Cape Village. And it's it's uh, designed to support uh, the building against a flow of water from one direction or the other. And the way these braces were placed, water could impact it from almost any direction. And there'd be some system of braces that would help support the, the foundation of the structure. When we began looking at that, we, we realized that a number of the, the ones that were still in place were actually wa- rotted out at the ground level. Uh, so one of the things that we've done is is gone in and started replacing that bracing as we could to help support those buildings. The other thing that's that's again one of those those hard decisions is to decide that we're not going to allow entry into some of these buildings. To me, one of the uh, important things about Portsmouth is the historic landscape, and if you lose a building, you've lost an important piece of that historic landscape does no good to talk about a community when you can't see the community anymore. So in order to make sure that we could at least save some of these buildings that were heavily damaged, what we're not doing is putting floors back in some of them. Some of the ones that had the floors absolutely destroyed, what we're doing is shoring them up, replacing some of the structural members, but leaving the floors out. And of course, that by all accounting and reckoning uh, that we've done should help them survive future storms. It's also important to keep windows in in buildings. Once the wind gets in, uh, it's, it's just, it's almost impossible to keep it from doing some kind of damage. So that's one of the things that, that uh, we've made it a, a big point of is making sure that all those windows opening openings are sealed and that those windows are intact. Has there ever been any discussion about elevating the structures? Yes, so there has been, and that's always a possibility. So resiliency is one of the things you can do to to increase resiliency is raise the structures. And we actually did a study on this uh, uh, that was completed last year and formalized. And one of the questions on there was how uh, can we help make these buildings uh, more resilient that would be acceptable to the visitors, local community, descendants, and historic preservationists. And, uh, you know, the key to that was, uh, yeah, uh, there were a lot of people who thought, okay, yeah, raising them is okay. One of the things that we didn't ask them about was, what if you can't walk through the village anymore? And by that, I mean, you know, climate change is, is happening. We, we're seeing it out there in places where we used to have lawn grass. We've got three varieties of marsh grass growing now. Uh, our trees are dying. The water level is coming up. So how long do we have before you can no longer walk through those villages? And in that case, what, what value do we have in elevating the buildings? If people can't come in and... and enjoy and learn from that historic landscape, then then what value is there in in raising those buildings? Many people uh, in the descendant side felt that if you change the landscape, you also ruined it. So it's an interesting and difficult uh, area to cross through. And, and, you know, we'll continue to to, uh, feel that out as best we can. It is not as simple as saying we're going to raise buildings. There's an expense involved there. And it's significant when you've got to get personnel and equipment uh, into some of these remote locations. Absolutely. Now, your plan is to install waysides on the sites of these structures after they've been torn down. What do you think is important for the waysides to convey? And uh, any way to incorporate any of the scrap materials into the waysides or maybe, you know, leave existing foundations or chimneys? 
Yeah, absolutely. And and one of the things that we've talked about is how do we say, you know, where was the site? You can always take pictures, but you really don't get that. So can we leave some of the pilings in place? At least you could understand the, the volume the house once had. So that's definitely part of the discussion on how that would be presented. You know, what's key to me is that, that uh, when you when you go up to a wayside, does it convey, you know, the culture and heritage that was represented by whatever site was there before that you could no longer preserve? And I, I think that's going to be the important part. Can we show how that building uh, contributed to the community? Can we show how people lived out of that building and what impact did they have on you know, life in, in Portsmouth or Cape Village. Those are the things that we want to try to capture there is, is that piece of human history that even the architecture standing there by itself can't tell you, but, but uh, that you can, if you can read about it, perhaps understanding and gain some insight into, you know, what it meant to live in a place like that when people live there. You were recently quoted as saying, I have put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into trying to get us back on track with the preservation of these buildings, and it sure sounds like you have. What has this process taught you going forward? Well, you know, I I believe one thing. I believe you do have to get out there and work with actual preservation and and uh, work with the SHPO's office and work with the community to and, understand. And what is the SHPO's office? Oh, I'm sorry. The the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, we share responsibility with them, and 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 uh, they have been hugely helpful in technical advice and in supporting and understanding. You know what we're facing out here, but you know working with with uh, all these groups closely and being out in the site, so you understand the the difficulties that are involved in doing this. I think it's important uh, in a, for you to be able to communicate the problems uh, with it. I hope I've communicated some of the problems and the opportunities that we have out there with, with uh, the historic uh, preservation in these villages. Now, without a doubt, you are seeing the effects of climate change within these historic areas, as you mentioned, as well as the seashore in general. Can you give us some perspective on that? Well, I can try. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, the maritime environment is a hard place to exist, uh, and uh, you know, besides the storms everybody hears about, uh, the hurricanes and tropical depressions and tropical storms, a simple nor'easter storm will oftentimes do as much damage as a hurricane, and we have several of those every every winter, and. Uh, you know, uh, the battle, the battle just never ends. So, you know, at some point in time, you have to say, uh, how do we figure out a way to work within the environment that we know we've got uh, without doing the same things over and over again that we know are going to fail? And uh, that's that's even harder when you're dealing with the historic structure because you want to preserve that historic nature and that historic setting. But there are ways to do it. We've just had to, you know, think about them and approach it. You know, the the whole concept of of climate change, uh, you know, we we see it. We see it every day. And we've seen and and continue to see the changes that are occurring out here. Uh, The three varieties of marsh grass that are growing in the lawns now at Portsmouth is a perfect example. The uh, marsh um, moving into Cape Village. Uh, is a is an is another great example. So you know, it's not like it's uh, some esoteric thing that we're just thinking about here. We're living it. And we're trying to adapt to what's going on, and I think that is the key: adaptation. Jeff West, thank you for your time today. Hurricane season has ended for 2020, and we'll hope that next year's hurricane season will be kind to the Outer Banks and to our national seashores. Thank you, Lynn. I really appreciate it. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. 
With 2020 nearly done, next week we'll be taking a look back at some of the major stories across the National Park System with Kristen Brengel from the National Parks Conservation Association and Phil Francis from the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks. We'll also take a look ahead to the Biden administration and its expected approach to public lands in the National Park System. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast series is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.